please stand as we begin our call to worship to the weak who can't go on and need strength to the wounded who are broken and long to be whole to the wayward who are lost and far from home we welcome you here to community in the name of the living Jesus I want to read out of Hebrews the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. We come here this morning as a congregation, as a community, to bring our focus onto Jesus. And he is beautiful, and he is wonderful, and he is mighty. So please join us. Let it wash over you as a time when we're focusing on our Savior. Please sing out.
confession to our God and Savior. And we've just sung a, a song, it's a prayer of our deep need for God. We've declared our need for him. And so today we want to take a, a focus on those areas in our lives where rather than seeking his truth, his guidance, his molding, we are relying on ourselves or the influences of the world and even maybe perhaps allowing our own stubbornness to direct us. We want to take a time to listen and to confess. And I invite you into a time of silent prayer to place those areas onto God's altar. Father God, you are our creator and we praise you. You are holy, you are righteous, and we praise you. We thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the gift of your word to show us your will, to show us your way. God, we thank you for your love for us, for its steadfastness unimaginably to us. We thank you that it is higher than we can imagine, lower than we can imagine. 
I pray this morning that your spirit will work in our hearts as a community, as a congregation. Guide us as we look to your word, as Tony brings the word before us. Give us spirits that are moldable by you and only by you, Lord Jesus. Bend us to your will. May we delight in your instruction. In your son's name, amen.
Good morning. My name is Kristen Paleo, and I'll be reading the scripture for this morning's sermon. It crosses two chapters, so uh, make that jump with us. It begins in chapter 18, verses 1 to 12, and then um, continues in chapter 19, verses 1 to 12. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plan it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. But they say that is in vain. We will follow our own plans and will every one act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Thus says the Lord, go buy a potter's earthenware flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnon at the entry of the potsherd gate and proclaim there the words that I tell you. You shall hear, you shall say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I am bringing such disaster upon this place that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Because the people have forsaken me and have profaned this place by making offerings in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known. And because they have filled this place with the blood of innocence and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall no more be called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnon, but the valley of slaughter. And in this place I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem, what caused their people to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hand of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city a horror, a thing to be hissed at. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of all of its wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, So will I break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Topheth, because there will be no place else to bury. Thus will I do to this place, declares the Lord, and to its inhabitants, making this city like Topheth. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Well, at this time, uh, the people that are going to the cafe to go over the sermon in a second language can be dismissed, as well as uh, the children age four to kindergarten can be dismissed now and go with Kara.
Well, my name's Tony. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Community. Um, and this morning, we're going to continue through the book of Jeremiah, um, through our series that's titled Hope for Those Who Surrender. Um, I was excited to see uh, my, my buddy, my pickleball buddy, Dan, came out today. Uh, I told you I was a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't believe me because I was beating up on him so bad on the pickleball court. <laughs> he could, uh, well, if you haven't been here, or, or, or if you've been here and just haven't been paying attention, uh, we've been going through the book of Jeremiah for a couple weeks now. Jeremiah, uh, he lived about 600 years before Jesus, which means... Uh, almost about 3,000 years before us. He lived in a small town outside of Jerusalem called Anathoth. Uh, I, I always feel like I have a, a lisp when I, when I say that, Anathoth, outside of Jerusalem. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet. He became a priest, and he delivered a series of messages to God's people. Uh, and those messages were not received well. Those messages, poems he wrote, uh, autobiographical stories, they were compiled into a book by a scribe named Baruch, and that compilation is what we call the book of Jeremiah. And almost 3,000 years later, his message to Israel is still relevant to us today. I've titled today's message, Two Sure Things. Years ago, I was at a, a big uh, Christian men's conference, um, and I saw a guy wearing a t-shirt, and on the front it said, uh, two things are for sure. Number one, there's a God, and I had to wait for him to walk by me to see what was on the back. Number two, you're not him. It seems like a simple concept, but it's one that we often fail to grasp. There's a God, and we're not him. Adam and Eve in the garden, in direct communication with the God who made them, given direct instructions of what to do and what not to do, they decide, with some help from a serpent, to do what they want to do. And people have been making that same mistake ever since. So what hope do we have? I'll ask you again, what, what hope do we have? Um, and I'll ask you to pray with me. Father God, uh, Lord, you are, you are awesome. Your, your creative abilities are so far above ours. Lord, and your grace and your love so far above ours. You give us all that we need to be all that you've made us to be, and yet so often we place our hope somewhere else. Father God, help us. Help us uh, as, we, as we look at these passages this morning and see the warnings that you graciously give to your people, Lord, over decades before you finally bring discipline. Help us to know, Lord, that uh, you are a God not to be fooled with, but help us also to know that, that you are a God who loves us deeply. And we ask all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. So number one, there's a God. Number two, you're not him. I'm not him. Theologians call this the creator-creature distinction. It's a Slightly fancier way of saying, there's a God, you're not him. But really grasping that is what the Bible calls the beginning of wisdom. Really getting a hold of this idea that, that there's a God and I'm not him. And most people say to that, I know. I know there's a God and I know I'm not him. And probably the people that Jeremiah is giving his message to in today's passage would say that as well. 
We know there's a God. We know we're not him. Jeremiah is simply pointing out to them that they're not acting like it. They're not acting like they know. Their walk is not lining up with their talk. And their walk, the way they're living, is not just a little bit off, but it's, it's so far off that God is about to do something drastic about it. And God is sending Jeremiah to warn them. Chapter 18 starts out, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I'll let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. If you've ever tried using a, a pottery wheel to make something with clay, you know it's, it's a common occurrence for the thing you're making to be spoiled. The wheel could be spinning too fast, the clay too wet, too dry. Maybe you made the walls of the vessel too thin and you get what's I call it a blowout. Uh, it just sort of blah, 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 blah. But you can always kind of gather up the clay and start over. If we go down to verse 5, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah speaking here, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I'll build it and plan it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. But they say, that is in vain. We will follow our own plans and will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. So God has given Jeremiah this message for Israel. God reminds them of who he is, the potter who can shape the clay as he pleases. He reminds them of who they are, the clay, and then tells them to repent. This word repent, uh, it comes up a lot in sermons and in Bible studies. Sometimes street preachers will yell it at people as they walk by. Often it comes up without being defined very well. And, and it's generally not a word we use conversationally a lot. So I'll try and give that some clarity. It, it basically just means to change your mind, to point your life in a different direction, but not just any different direction. Biblically, it means to orient your life away from idols, away from sin, and toward the one true God. I've often heard repentance defined as turning away from sin, and that is part of it, but without also turning to God, our orientation is still off. If we don't end up with our lives pointed toward God, we can stop swearing, stop looking at porn, stop getting drunk, stop lying, stop stealing, and yet still be headed in the wrong direction, still following our own plans, still living as if we were the potter and all of God's creation is our clay. Right from the beginning of the Bible, God tells us what we are made of. In the second chapter of Genesis, verse 7, God's word says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So to be clear, this God took his dirt from his ground and breathed his breath to make his creatures. And yet somehow, for most of us, our most pressing question seems to be, what does God want me to do with my life? 
my time, my money, my talents. The best thing we can do is acknowledge that our lives are not our own. The earth and everything in it belongs to God. So the question should be, what does God want me to do with everything that I've been calling mine that actually belongs to him? And the answer is surrender. And let's admit it, that's not easy. This sermon series titled Hope for Those Who Surrender, the type of surrender that God calls for is not only difficult, but without his supernatural help, it's impossible. Because apart from God, we aren't just a little off. We are, like I said earlier, way off. Our hearts, apart from God, are evil and stubborn. In verses 13 through 16 of chapter 18, God is describing Israel's evil as something so bad it's unheard of. They've forgotten the God who has delivered them from bondage and sustained them. They've turned to false gods, and the consequences are undeniable. Our author Ayn Rand said, you can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. Israel has forgotten God, and it shows. And the same is true for us today. When we ignore God, the consequences to a culture eventually become impossible to ignore. We seem to be living in a culture that doesn't know who made them or what they were made for. Each person decides for themselves why they're here, as if we made ourselves. Isaiah speaks of this in the 29th chapter of the book of Isaiah. He says, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? That the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him, him who formed it, he has no understanding. The truth that Israel is trying to ignore is that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's in control absolutely. And as we see in these chapters in Jeremiah, if we, I'm sorry, if, we, if what we want is different from what God has made for us, there's a tension. An important part of resolving that tension is knowing that the only proper response to a holy God is surrender. Just what is it that we're responding to? In our case, it's the same as Israel's. It's God's goodness. The loving hands of the Father. And again, what is the right response? It's surrender. A surrender that shows itself in how we live, how we love, how we worship the God who made us. Ask yourself this simple question. Do I live like someone who knows there's a God who owns it all? And do I live like I know I'm not him. Is this surrender a once and done thing? I'd say in one way, yes. By God's grace, we turn from our sinful, prideful desire to live life on our own terms and turn to God and say, save me. And when we do that with sincerity, God's word tells us we will be saved. But in another way, our, our surrender grows. It matures as we mature. Years ago, I had a pastor taught me the acronym RACUS. Um, I've shared it with a number of guys. It's R-A-C-A-S, if you want to write it down. <laughs> so the R in RACUS stands for rebellion. Uh, this is when we are uh, immersed in our sin with no idea that we're wrong. Sinning and loving it. The, the next A, the next letter A, is admittance. And this is a progression. Um, and so, so generally, I'll, I'll, st I'll start over the R to the S, the S being surrender. Uh, we generally don't move straight from the R to the S. So these in-betweens, A, the ACA are in-between. Uh, hopefully is isn't too confusing. Uh, the first A is... Uh, admittance, where we're willing to 
give sort of intellectual assent or lip service to being wrong. And then we generally move to compliance, the C, where we're willing to do the right thing compliantly, but our heart's not in it. And then the next phase is the A for acceptance, where it starts to sink in that God's way is, is better than ours. And then finally, the S for surrender. This is where uh, God and God alone brings us to the point where we're really able to throw up our hands and admit God's way is better than ours. And the fact is that that often takes years, not days or weeks, to happen in different areas of our life. And it should make us glad that God's patient with us. Often when we see rebellion in others, we want swift and heavy justice, especially if that rebellion is directly affecting us. But when it's our rebellion, we want long-suffering patience. Just bear with me, Lord. I'll, I'll get it together. So what's going on here in the 18th chapter of Jeremiah is a rebellion that God describes as unheard of. Verse 13 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, ask among the nations, who has heard the like of this? The virgin Israel has done a very horrible thing. Does the snow of Lebanon leave the crags of Syrian? Do the mountain waters run dry, the cold flowing streams? But my people have forgotten me. They make offerings to false gods. They made them stumble in their ways in the ancient roads and to walk into side roads, not the highway, making their land a horror, a thing to be hissed at forever. Everyone who passes by it is horrified and shakes his head. This is a people, or if you will, a lump of clay that doesn't know it's a lump of clay. They've lost sight of who they are in relation to who God is. And it's made a mess of things, a horrible mess. In verse 17, God is declaring his response to their unfaithfulness. Judgment's coming, and God says, Like the east wind, I will scatter them before the enemy. I will show them my back, not my face, in the day of their calamity. And upon hearing this, the proud, rebellious Israelites offer a response to Jeremiah. Then they said, Come, let us make plots against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priests, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us strike him with the tongue, and let us not pay attention to any of his words. Hearing their response to this warning, a hurt Jeremiah delivers what I would call a rant to God. He's angry, and he's angry for good reason. He's interceded tearfully for a people who not only want to ignore him, but they want to punish him for doing what God has told him to do. I'll read the prophetic words he says before God in his anguish. Hear me, O Lord, and listen to the voice of my adversaries. Should good be repaid with evil? Yet they have dug a pit for my life. Remember how I stood before you to speak good for them, to turn away your wrath from them. Therefore, deliver up their children to famine, give them over to the power of the sword, let their wives become childless and widowed. May their men meet death by pestilence. Their youths be struck down by the sword in battle. May a cry be heard from their houses when you bring the plunderer suddenly upon them, for they have dug a pit to take me and laid snares for my feet. Yet you, O Lord, know all their plotting to kill me. Forgive not their iniquity, nor blot out their sin from your sight. Let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. So chapter 18 ends, but the warning of what's to come continues in chapter 19. Chapter 19 has God instructing Jeremiah to go to the potter and buy a flask. And he's to round up various leaders from the people and the priest and take them with him. Jeremiah is to read the grievances God has against them and the consequences he will bring upon them. And those consequences are beyond bad. I won't detail them here, but you can read chapter 19 for yourself. God tells Jeremiah then to break the flask and let them know this is how God will break them. 
It's the declaration of God's coming judgment. And all that is warned eventually comes to pass because God is a God who keeps his word. All this has happened because they refuse to hear God's words. I started out saying there are two things for sure. There's a God and you're not him. This is an account of people who lost sight of that. And they suffered the consequences. All the horrible things that Jeremiah prophesied came to pass. The good news that's revealed in the Bible is that we can know why we were made the way we were made. We can know what we were made for. And because we can know the one who made us, his name is Jesus, and he's a potter like no other. If you hear Jesus calling to you today, don't harden your heart. Come to the one who can show you why you were made and how you can have life to the full. Jesus is the only one that can move our hearts from rebellion to surrender. As I close up this morning, um, I want to put out a simple challenge for our last song. There's, there's a universal sign of surrender. It's the same in every language. It's raising our hands. Not like you want to get called on by the teacher, um, but rather like a soldier that's acknowledging they've encountered a force too great to fight. And I'm going to ask that as we sing the last song, try raising your hands in surrender. Something about that posture does something to us to change us. If you don't like it, put them back down. If you get tired, put them back down. But just give it a try with me. Um, I I don't think you'll hate it. Surrendering to the God who made us is truly the wisest thing that any lump of clay could do. Um, Will you pray with me? Father God, uh, Lord, we, we thank you for the love that you have shown to us in person of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, uh, you are the potter. Uh, we are the clay. Lord, this, this entire creation from the stars, the planets, every beautiful thing we see, Lord, has, has been spoken out of your mouth. You are, you are the great creator, and we are but your creatures. Um, may we live as such and glorify your name. Amen. Please stand.
go as a, a people surrendered to God and have a great week in the grace of Jesus Christ.